Thank you so much that you've joined me, Bertie Brits, in today's broadcast of The Love Way. What a blessing to come to your house. What a blessing to just share the message of God's grace with you. Before I continue in the session, I would just like to use this opportunity to thank everybody that's been so generous towards Dynamic Love Ministries, towards what God is doing in my life. You know, I just believe that God is just a God of blessing and prosperity. He's a God of love and grace. And He's been working in your heart to donate towards this ministry. Man, and your do donations has been so generous that all my airtime is covered by what people give through this um, television broadcasts. Man, thank you so much. God bless you for that. It's good to know that I have not begged the money from you, but that you've given it by grace. And that's why it's acceptable, because it has been coming from a free heart. Thank you for that. And also the people just, just respond through the SMS is saying, man, Bertie, you're a blessing. This ministry has changed my life. It has just brought a change in, change in my life. I've been healed. I, my situation has changed. My marriage has been healed. I got free from things that have been binding me. Man, the law has just been, I've been delivered from that mentality. Thanks for all those SMSs. Continue to send them. It's good to know that there's a family out there that I, that I don't even know personally, but that we are one in this message of grace. Thank you so much. Well, let's continue in the Word of God. We, um, we're going to read from Romans chapter 7 and Romans chapter 6 from verse 16. But before we get in there, I want to just uh, lay this foundation again. You know, the law is the mentality that says, I am not, but I need to become. Now, connected to that law are commandments. And let me give you a good example of that. Every country in the world wants good drivers. Now, for them to have good drivers on the road, they need to lay down certain rules that says you must apply to these commandments and once you can do these commandments, the things I command you and you qualify, I will declare you as a good driver and then I'll release the freedom that, um, to drive on the roads of our country. Now, every country goes out from the standpoint that says every person out there without a license are bad drivers. They are not good drivers. They're not allowed on the road because they, how do we know that they are good? So the standpoint of the law is you are not. You need to become. So because the people in every country are under a law that says you are not a good driver, you need to become a good driver. You need to qualify. And once we see you're a good driver, you become a good driver by completing the tests and by um, first having a learner's license, then you drive for a while, while somebody teaches you, and then when you're good enough, you can come and then you can qualify. Once you've qualified, we'll give you the freedom um, that you desire because you are then a good driver. So, there's a law that says you are not good. Then commandments are laid down what you must do in order to be a good driver. In America... They will say you need to drive on the right-hand side of the road. That's the commandment they've laid down. And, if you, and, and then if you come to South Africa, they will say you must drive on the left-hand side of the road uh, if you're a good driver. Just one of the things, you must keep left. The golden rule that I've been taught is you drive on the left-hand side of the road. That's the commandment. But the law is you're not a good driver. You need to become a good driver. So... In America, there's a law that says you need to become. In South Africa, there's a law that says you need to become, but with different commandments. And the change of commandment does not mean there's a change of law. And this is what I want to say through this. Many people go to church, and when they are in church, they maybe get fed up with the pastor, they get angry. They say, well, this pastor is not a good pastor, or this reverend is not a good reverend. He's under the law. And you'll ask him, why would you say he's under the law? And he would say, no, because he says we must wear these clothes. We must pay our tithes. We must do this. We must do this. And I am tired of the law because the Bible says I'm under grace. I'm going to leave this church and go to another church. Then he goes to the other church and, I, and you can ask him, how are you doing now? He says, no, I am free. This is a free church. You ask him why. He says, no, in this church, 
um, I'm allowed to clap my hands. The pastor taught us that we should clap our hands if we want the presence of God to come down and we must worship, then the presence of God will manifest and we then must blow the shofar and then God his presence is going to come down. And if we don't do that, then the presence is not even going to come down. This is really a church that's so free. We are not under the law. You know, that man's just deceived. That's all. He's not free. He's mega deceived. Because he's just changed his commandments. He's, not, he's, he's still under the law. He still believes that he is not blessed. He still believes that the presence of God is not with him 24 hours of the day. And he still believes that he must do certain things for the presence of God to come down. He is still under the law. And I tell you, a couple of years down the line, he's going to be upset with that pastor as well because he's experiencing the frustration of the law in his heart and then he wants to find the fault with a man. Now, let me put it this way. If you can get under grace and, and you're not thinking that by changing the commandments you're getting free of the law, you must get free of the law and the commandments. By getting free from the law, being the mentality that I am not and I need to become, you will automatically be free from commandments because you will say there's nothing that I need to do in order to become. There was a law that says we are not and we need to become. And then Jesus became a man in the likeness of sinful flesh, born under the law, and then he obeyed all the commandments on your behalf. And once he obeyed all the commandments, the law unleashed its freedom that says, you are now righteous and you can be blessed. Good things can be done unto you now. And Jesus did that on your behalf. Man, isn't that awesome? Through the obedience of one, many shall be made righteous. Man, that is so profound. It is so powerful through the obedience of one. Not the obedience of you, but the obedience of Christ. You've been made righteous, and righteousness are imputed unto you, and you are set free from the law. And all of a sudden, you know, if somebody comes to me and says, you need to do these things to prosper, I said to him, why would I want to prosper? No, don't you want to prosper? I don't understand what you're talking about. No, don't you want more? Man, I've got it all. So I cannot be tempted with your commandment. Because if I'm under your commandment, my flesh will be activated and sin will come forth in my life. So I'm not tempted. Do you want more of God? No, I don't want more of God. I've got it all. Oh, do you say you are perfect in my flesh, by my work? I'm not. But by Christ? Oh yes, I am. The Bible says... As many as are perfect, be this minded. So, I mean, we have reached perfection through Jesus Christ. Not in our works, not in our human flesh, but in the obedience of Christ. Perfection is imputed unto me. Now, don't you want more? No, I, I thank God for what I have. The Bible says to those who have, more will be given. So, I don't desire more. I thank God for what I have. And as I see, I just get more revelation. So I don't desire more. I thank God for what I've got. And because I know what I have, I don't walk by the mentality of I'm not and I seek. Bertie, are you not seeking a revival? No, I, I'm not seeking one. I'm in the middle of one. I've been revived. I tell you, and the more I know that I am in a, I have been revived, wherever I go, I see revival. I see people's lives being changed. I see people being touched and changed and whatever. Now, maybe my definition of revival differs from yours, but my definition of revival is people believing grace. That's a revival. I tell you because it's so few people that's really getting into that because we've been so bombarded with the law and people think it's not the law, they think they are free, but they've just changed their commandments. By just changing the commandments, they think they are free and preaching a thing, you know. We are free, we worship with our hands in the air, but... That means you must now do this, otherwise God cannot bless you. I once heard somebody say, you know, if you smoke, you're not going to go to hell, but sure as hell, you're going to smell like hell when you get to heaven. Now that's a lie. You're not going to smell like hell when you go to heaven if you smoke. And I don't smoke, and I don't promote smoking, 
My father-in-law at the moment is in intensive care because a uh, uh, main artery burst because of, it has been damaged because of smoking. So I don't say you should smoke. It's very bad for your health. But don't make smoking uh, uh, your way unto righteousness and how you stand before God. No, it's not the truth. I want to tell you, if you're a smoker out there, God loves you, God cares for you, and if you are tired of smoking, you can now stop. Because of His Spirit that's in you that has set you free. Hallelujah. The same with alcohol, the same with any type of addiction and sin there is. If you are listening to me and you're a heroin addict and your mother has forced you to listen to me, let me tell you good news. You are free already. You can stop now if you want to. And I know you want to. Because in us there's a desire to stop with that thing. And if you can realize that I don't have to become free from this, but I am free, and I today take my freedom and walk in my freedom, you'll be free. Hallelujah. As a man believes in his heart, so easy, and from his heart flows the force that drives his life. If you believe in your heart, you are free. The force of freedom will drive you to be free from the thing that binds you. Man, isn't that awesome? Bertie, don't you uh, uh, believe that you must still change? In my physical, in the physical, yes, there is change. But I am not physical. I'm spiritually minded. And you might say, but how can we reason with a guy like you? Because, you know, there's, you, you think you've got it all. Well, I, I'm sorry. I'm a victim. It's been given to me. And I'm willing to take it. Thank you, Jesus. And all, don't you want to take it? And walk in that freedom? Well, Bert, it mean, does that mean I will have no more problem in this physical world? You know what it means? It means that when you get a problem in this physical world, you will find the power inside you to go through that problem and know how to handle it. And you will not be tempted by the devil with the ten things he'll tell you what you must do in order to be like God. The devil wants you to get under the law because the moment you are under the law, you will say, I desire, I want to be like God. Now, is it wrong to desire? It's not wrong to desire. It's not wrong to desire righteousness. It's not wrong to desire holiness. It's not wrong to hunger for righteousness. It's not wrong. But know this, if you hunger for righteousness, you will be filled. And the filling of righteousness is by Jesus imputing it unto you, and then you are now full. You know, if I've been eating in a restaurant, and I've had enough, so much that when they even bring the dessert, I say, no thank you. You know, I'm not going to come home and on the way home buy myself two hamburgers from McDonald's. I'm not going to do that. Because... I cannot be tempted with a Big Mac or a whatever you name it. Kentucky Fried Chicken cannot tempt me. McDonald's cannot tempt me with their food. Nobody can tempt me with anything because I am full. Hallelujah. Now I know this is a shocker for religion, but man, get over it. Take the good news of Jesus Christ and be free. Hallelujah. There's freedom for us. Let's get out of this thing that we are not. And... and, and we must still become. If we can, you, you will never have a revival if you don't believe you are in a revival. If you don't believe wherever you go there's a revival, you will never have a revival. And this I say for church leaders so that you can know this. Start to believe the truth about who you are. What is revival? It's to be revived. Adam died and now Jesus came and, uh, and he became a man and revived man. So when you get into Christ, you are revived. And revival is by grace. That's all. It's by grace. It's by God's goodness. It's by God's mercy. And if you look at a lot of the Old Testament, or not Old Testament, um, revivals uh, years ago, uh, old revivals, you know what, will what, what you will see out of that? They've done nothing right to get it. The, some of them even preached the law. They saw the power of God manifesting. And I believe that is a sign and to the church today, that it's not by what you do that you will see the power of God manifesting. Man, isn't that awesome? That is so, so profound, so powerful. Right, let's get into Romans chapter 6, and we're going to talk, we're going to continue to talk about how uh, the law is the thing that produces sin in your life, 
and um, we're going to clarify that doctrinally a little bit because you know uh, you might write me an email and say the law is not evil and the law is not evil you can go and look at some of the previous sessions especially uh, the fulfillment of the law number seven where I spoke on the holiness of the law and let's just look at this it says yet what then shall we sin because we are under the law but under grace God forbid Know you not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto the law. So he says here, shall we continue in sin now that we are not under the law but under grace? He says no. Sin will not come forth in your life when you are under grace. Why? He says here, because when you yield yourself a servant to the law, um, Sin will come forth in your life and you'll be a servant of sin and you'll obey the passions of sin because you are under the law, because you yielded your obedience to um, think that by what I do I'll become, sin comes forth and you are an obe a, a servant of sin, a servant of death. Now, it says here that obedience will bring forth righteousness. Now you might say, yes, Bertie, you see there it's written in the New Testament in the lovely book of Romans chapter 6 that if you obey then you'll be righteous and I tell you I've had so many people telling me that obedience is the biggest thing in the kingdom of God you must obey God if he says this you must obey and I agree I'm not against obedience but let's read the next verse but God be thanked that you were servants of sin how are we servants of sin by being under the law but you have obeyed from your heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. So what is obedience? Obedience is obeying a certain doctrine or a certain teaching, not commandments. The context of obedience in Romans chapter 6 here is not obedience to the law, but obedience to the teaching that says you've been justified by grace, you've been justified by the goodness of God, you've been justified by the obedience of Jesus. When you obey that by saying, I believe that, then you've been set free from the power of sin, and therefore you shall not sin anymore. So the message of grace is the only license, the only um, thing that will produce holiness in you, and the law is that which will kill you and destroy your life. So let's continue in the goodness of God, Let's continue in the mercy of God and the grace of God. Now let's go to Romans chapter 7 and we're going to look at the working of the law in the life of a person. And I want to tell you, it still works like this in the life of a believer as well. Don't think that you've received the Holy Spirit as a power source to obey the law. That is the biggest form of deception that I've ever heard. Never think that you, uh, the Holy Spirit is there to give you strength so that you can now do the Ten Commandments. No, we, the old man has died. Get the previous session and listen to it. It says in verse 9, For I was al alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So what does Paul say? He says that there was a time in his life when he was alive without the law. Now, when was he alive without the law? He was alive without the law when he was when he just got saved. Because the Bible says he was born under the law. If you go and read in Galatians, he says, man, he was born under the law. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was trained under Gamaliel. He was circumcised. He was under the law from the seventh or eighth day when they were circumcised. Now, imagine that. He was under the law. But here he says, I was alive without the law once. So when was that? I believe it was after he got saved after he got into the message of grace. Now listen to this. But when the commandment came, when I came under commandments, you must do this, you must do this, sin revived and I died. And you can go and read the book of Acts and you can go and see in Acts 20, 21, 22, where um, James the apostle has put Paul under commandments again. You must go and shave your head so that you can deny this thing that says that you have been telling the Gentiles not to obey Moses because they're going to kill you. And people were trying to force Paul under the law all the time. As people are trying to force uh, uh, people that believe in grace under the law all the time. And he says, when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, 
I found to be unto death. The law looks as if it's going to make you wise. Ask Eve. She looked at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She said, this is desirable to make you wise. She ate and died. Now this is what happened to Paul. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Verse 11. For sin. Now listen to this. And this is why the law is so deadly. It says, for sin, taking occasion. That word occasion is the Greek word for opportunity. It says, for sin taking its opportunity by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. Do you want to be slaughtered? I'm asking a question. Do you want to be slaughtered? Let's read this. For sin taking its opportunity by the commandment deceived me and it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me, God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. So what does he say here? He says that sin by the commandment becomes exceedingly sinful, produces death in me, it slaughters me, it kills me by that which is good. And that's why people are so easily deceived, because the law is good. It's good to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, everything that's within you. It's good to love your neighbor as yourself. It's good not to murder. But to say that if I don't murder, then I will become righteous. If I don't murder, then God's going to bless me. And if I don't do something wrong, then I'm going to go to heaven. Man, that is wrong, and it will bring forth death in your life. Now, the law is good, but if you want to be justified by what you do, you're going to die. And this is what Paul says. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do, do not. But that which I hate, that I do. This is when I'm under the law. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I, listen to this, now then, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, w if I, do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Now listen, man. Paul wrote something so powerful and so profound. I thank God that he was not afraid of the Jews. He was not afraid of the old Israelites. He was not afraid of death, willing to write this. Man, I thank God for that. What he says here, he says, when I'm under the commandment, the commandment says, you must do good. When I'm under that commandment, and I try to do good, evil is with me. And I realize something, Paul said, it's not I who sin, but it's the sin in me. Now I tell you, many people will be afraid to say that, but the apostle Paul said it, inspired by the Holy Spirit, therefore I will say it. If I sin, it's not I. I don't sin. It's the sin in me that sins. Now, I don't want the sin in me to sin, because it will kill me. It will bring forth death and destruction to me. So, I'm not the one that sins. The sin in me sins, and brings, sins, brings death to me. So, I don't want it to be active in my life. And he says here, that the moment I say, I want to do good, I find a law that says, then evil is with me. Now, he says here, if you go and read it, he says, And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death, for sin is taking its opportunity by the commandment. So if you come to a place where you say, I don't want to do good. I am good. And good is in me. And Christ lives through me. And the source of all good lives in me and flows out of me. And I don't desire to do good because I am good and good flows out of me because of Christ in me. Sin will have no opportunity in your flesh to live in you and you'll find holiness in your life. You'll start to forgive that man that really has, has, has brought destruction to you. 
You know, one day I, somebody really made me so upset and I struggled to forgive him. And I found a very good friend of mine that's a good news preacher, a righteousness preacher. You know what he said to me? And I struggled to forgive this guy. It was just so bad. And for, I would say, three or four days, it was really hammering me in my heart. And um, I phoned him. I said, my brother, I need to forgive this guy. That's really made me so angry. And he said to me, you know what's your problem? You don't have a forgiveness problem. Because you know that you should forgive. And in your heart, you want to forgive him. But what you've got is you don't know how to handle what he's done towards you. You know, when he said that, and I wasn't under the law that says, you've got unforgiveness, you sinner, you... You know, I all of a sudden just felt free. When he said that, I felt free. I said, well, you know, that means that there's not unforgiveness in me, but that forgiveness is in me. I phoned straight away and said, you know, I found forgiveness in my heart. You've forgiven. It's all over. Thank God I accept you the way you are. I know how to handle this. I'm not going to let my life be ruled by what you do, but I'm going to be ruled by what Christ has done for me. And I was set free. A smile was upon my face. Man, isn't that awesome? Now, we are running out of time. I think we ran out of time already. But, man, thank God for this good news. Let us just hear more of that praise reports. Let us just get that prayer request. We'll pray for you. If you want to make use of our ministry products, it's up for a donation of any amount. Amen. Thank you and God bless you.